What do you think it's going to take for the commissioner to have that add that extra week and maybe that extra playoff uh, uh, team in each conference? What it would take, I believe, is uh, an outbreak such as Baltimore's, but an outbreak such as Baltimore's that shows no signs of flagging. So in other words, you know, the outbreak in Baltimore is now getting less. There were two more players added to it Saturday, one on Sunday. And the Ravens have been told flat out by Alan Sills and the people inside the NFL, look, we see this going away. You know, we think we have this virus contained. Now, if they were in the middle of it and every day they're getting eight or 10 more people put on the list, that is when I believe the NFL would say, we got to create a week 18 uh, if and only if that uh, the games have some playoff significance. If, if Jacksonville and the Jets, I don't even know if they're playing, but if Jacksonville and the Jets had a game canceled or a game postponed, they wouldn't make up the game. And I'm kind of bummed out after talking to you, Pete. I don't know if we, we had any good news here. Any, anything to any – What about – hey, can, can we just mention Patrick Mahomes and how watching him every week is a gift the way Bulls fans used to have with Michael Jordan? But it took us a little while to take Mike for granted. I, I said this a month ago. I said, Patrick Mahomes is the MVP. If, if we want to do this week to week where we go, who's the MVP and who's in and who's – Patrick Mahomes is – like, it's not even close right now, I, I don't think. What he does... Well, it's a, you know what? It's a 16-game award. And uh, I think after six weeks, I easily, I definitely would have voted for Russell Wilson. Okay. Today, I would vote for Mahomes and Rodgers, and Wilson would be uh, second and third in some order. But you're right. I, you know what? And I hope... L- listen, I'm voting for the MVP every year. I'm not saying, well... Uh, Mahomes won it three years in a row. I'm not voting for him this year. I'm voting for somebody else. That's not the way you do it. Every single year is a snowflake. It's an individual entity. It's different. And if he's the MVP, vote for him. But look, <laughs> you know, right now, today, entering December, he is the MVP. 30 touchdowns, two interceptions. And, and it doesn't look difficult. You know? I, That's I, the amazing thing. Everything comes easy to him. Dan, last week, they're in Vegas, Okay. And they're down, uh, you know, they're down by four points at three different points of the second half. And each time they go down four, he comes back with a drive of over 70 yards. And you're right. It just does not look hard. It's the amazing part of watching him play. It's a gift. And look, Aaron Rodgers is unbelievable, too. He's absolutely fantastic. And he is carrying that team as well uh, as Mahomes is with Kansas City. So sometimes you forget about Rodgers, but he's unbelievably good. Well, it's late November, Rick. I don't know if we know how good this Tampa Bay team is. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Where do you think they stand in the pantheon of NFC teams right now? They're the masters of meh. They're They're just not very good. Um, you know, they're average or a little bit above. Look, they've played some tough teams, right, the last couple of weeks. I mean, they had a couple of three-point games against the Rams uh, and then the Chiefs, and, and they just haven't started games well. I think they've been outscored like 49-7 to seven in the first quarter of their last four games. And when you start games like that, uh, when you don't convert third downs, I mean, yesterday uh, they, they had one conversion in the first four series. And, you know, they've added so many pieces, Dan. Antonio Brown, there was this, this – uh, this blitz early in the game where you can see, you know, Brown just goes out and he doesn't recognize the blitz and, and, you know, Brady's yelling. It's like Vince Vaughn and the wedding crashers, hot route, hot route. You know, (laughs) I don't know what you mean. What's a hot route. Like, so it's just been kind of grab bag like that. And, and uh, you know, they've they've got a bye week. They need it and they got to get it together. I'm going to play this Patrick Mahomes bite and you were there, but just to let the fans hear this, I thought Patrick Mahomes did a site survey of the Super Bowl. You know, you go down there just in case you're going to be playing in the Super Bowl. Here's Patrick Mahomes on getting familiar with Tampa. You get a a familiarity uh, with the stadium, with the process of going to the hotel in the city. Um, And and that's definitely something that eases your mind when you try to get to the Super Bowl. You you know, you've been in this place before and you understand what what, what kind of the pregame and stuff like that happens. And then to beat a good football team, that's a really good football team with a lot of talented players. 
uh, that's, a, that's a great thing about football and the NFL is you build and build and try to execute and be the best at the end of the season. What? That, <laughs> it was like they did a walkthrough and they won an NFL <laughs> game. He, he is so going back. <laughs> he, he knows he's going back. And, uh, you know, he probably did scout out the restaurants while he was here. Wow. I did see him come out earlier than I've seen most quarterbacks. Now, maybe this is his routine. You know, I mean, Brady gets to the stadium about four and a half hours before the game and walks around in his, in his uh, you know, in his street clothes. But, um, but Mahomes did survey the field. I mean, he went end to end with, with really very little players out there. And was oh, he did that during the game too, Rick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brady knew what he was getting himself into, but did he really know what he was getting himself into? Well, like, you know, win or lose, we booze, man. I mean, it's like, I, I think he knew. He had to have talked to, to uh, Peyton Manning and those guys. I know everybody asks me every time Bruce Arians calls him out, you know, uh, how can how can you do this to, to uh, Tom Brady? And and I would just say that, like, if Brady didn't know that, then he did no research. I mean, and, and I think there's a part of Brady, not that he likes to have to field questions from us about it, but that, you know, he wants the other guys on his team to see that he's being held as accountable as everybody else. I mean, that's big for Tom. Tom wants to assimilate into the team. So uh, I, I I know that apparently uh, Tony Romo was all over Arians' offense. I'm not naive to think that, like, I agree with you. They probably had a discussion. And and there is a, a desire of Tom for them to move closer to what he wants to do. But in Bruce's offense, Tom's getting hit a lot. And nobody likes, like, nobody likes to get hit because he gets so many guys out. They're going to have to make some adjustments with protection because when he has it, he's very, very good. Do you think you could have played quarterback in the NFL like we saw with the Broncos yesterday? You know, I, it, it, it's, I, I'm glad you asked that question. That was a great question to start with. Um, you know, in my, in my career, I'm, I'm one for two with an interception and a touchdown. So, you know, you know I'm, I'm going to be high risk, high reward. I felt like, uh, you know, the Broncos were kind of put in a horrible situation, but you know, if you have a running back, I, I, it was just weird to see them put a practice squad uh, college quarterback there. When you have a running back, you could just run wildcat the whole game. We saw the Carolina Panthers do it. I would have did it. Like, we, when I was in Jacksonville, I was the emergency quarterback, and we had a package set up where we'd run six or seven plays, two passes, five runs, and we were just going to make it work. Well, plus you have somebody who's on the practice squad, doesn't even get any reps in practice whatsoever. Should that game have been played yesterday, Mo? Yeah, I don't. I don't think so because then one team has a, a serious competitive advantage, and you saw how you were able to move the Ravens Steelers game back to Tuesday. I felt like they should have moved the Saints uh, Broncos game back to Tuesday as well. And, and you know, then you have a short week, but you give the team at least an opportunity to compete. And to be honest, like I, I felt like if Denver would have had a quarterback, the game might have been a completely different game because Taysom Hill, Taysom Hill didn't play. Uh, like he did against the Falcons. So you might have had an opportunity to steal that one. I love this tweet by uh, Kevin Clark. He says, the idea of a game without quarterbacks is more fun than an actual game without quarterbacks. Yeah, as you know, it's all about rhythm. You get that rhythm going. Offense gets the rhythm. You get confidence there. But they don't have any of that. Would you, would you start Jalen Hurts? There's, there's a reason Jalen Hurts is not starting. He's not good enough. Not that he won't be someday, but with this pandemic that we're all dealing with right now, COVID-19, there was no offseason. Those are important. There was no training camp. That's important. There were no preseason games to develop a young quarterback. That's important. I think it would be a disservice to Jalen Hurts to put him out there. The number one goal of the head coach and the team is to win. You want to put the best players on the field that give you the best chance to win. Apparently, from the coaching staff and Doug Peterson, Jalen Hurts is not ready to step in. You know, you, you could damage a young quarterback for his whole career. And I always think of a guy that always comes to my mind, Patrick Ramsey, who I thought had enormous talent with the Washington football team now. But he got beat up so bad, they were losing, and he never recovered from that. So this is a football team right now in Philly that's in a transition phase. This is not a team that's going to compete, you know, for the playoffs or a Super Bowl for, for a number of years right now. This team needs to be retooled. Now the question then now is you have to ask Doug Peterson, who are you going to retool with? Ask Howie Roseman. You know, ask Jeffrey Lurie. Who are you going to retool with? Who's your quarterback going to be? Who is the guy you're going to hang your hat on for this next three to five years? This is a DK Metcalf after the game talked about Jim Schwartz comparing him to Calvin Johnson. I want you to hear it, and then I want you to translate here for us, Jaws. Here's DK Metcalf. 
What's your mindset going into a game when you know or when you feel like you're going to see a lot of uh, opposing teams number one cornerback? What's your mindset going into it? Um, I'm happy. Uh, I'm, I'm getting a little respect, um, but, you know, I still got work to do. Um, one of the defensive coaches came up to me and it kind of made me mad that he was like, um, you know, I was I was in Detroit with uh, Megatron, but you're not there yet. Um, you know, in my mind, I'm not trying to be Megatron. I'm trying to be me. So, um, you know, it had, it had a little uh, chip on my shoulder the whole game. Was that Jim Schwartz? Uh, yes, sir. All right. Interpret this. What was Jim? <laughs> what, was Jim Schwartz trying to compliment DK Metcalf? Yes, I believe so. I don't think uh, he was over there to in, be in, antagonistic to him. I think he uh, has great respect for him. Uh, and certainly Megatron was a great player. And Jim Schwartz was in Detroit when he was there. So he's very familiar with them. And they are both elite athletes. You know, Megatron was and certainly not DK Metcalf. And, 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 and Dan, you've been around this game long enough. You know what goes on pregame. You know, these coaches are out there with their business cards in their pocket because a lot <laughs> of them are going to get fired. And they're they're renewing old acquaintances with other teams. And he probably ran in. Ran in the DK and I said it, I, I don't see it as inflammatory I, you know uh, I don't see Jim as that kind of guy he can be quirky occasionally but he's never been that kind of guy he's usually very social before the game I thought it was a compliment because DK Metcalf is not Calvin Johnson he reminds me he might, reminds me a little bit more of T.O. than uh, Calvin Johnson but uh, it's still a compliment when I say hey but you're on your way <laughs> yeah. he's only been in the league a couple of years yeah I mean, if someone came up to me pregame and said, hey, Jaws, you look like Joe Namath, I'd be, like, really happy. <laughs> you know? you know? i go, wow, that's a real compliment, you know? <laughs> yeah, but if they, if, if they came, yeah, they said you look like him. You didn't play like him, but you just look like him. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get it. <laughs> I heard from a source this morning, and I want to bring this to your attention, about um, what has gone on with uh, the Ravens and uh, – this came from a league source uh, last night saying that, because uh, I said, do the Ravens feel like they're being picked on? And uh, what I got was classic hypocrisy. Uh, they won't be vigilant about the protocols in the front end. John Harbaugh cries he's being screwed on the back end for consequences of said violations. His coaching staff was responsible for the outbreak there. What do you make of that comment? Well, you know, there's still work being done to figure out how, you know, the entry point in the building. Uh, but obviously there's a lot of focus on the strength and conditioning coach. Uh, the Ravens disciplined him um, and suspended him for a while. And uh, we'll see about that. But yeah, obviously when you have this many cases uh, and we're talking about over 30 now in the building, uh, you know, not just counting players, we're talking about support staff you have to wonder whether the protocol was all being uh, f followed. And the Ravens had said a lot this year about how comfortable they were with the protocol and, and how much money and time they invested in it. And now they've had the team with the biggest, uh, you know, they've been the team with the biggest outbreak in the NFL. So there's obviously some questions there uh, that they're going to have to answer um, in terms of whether they're following protocol and what they were and were not doing. Andrew Brandt had a, a tweet earlier today, of course, former front office, front office executive. Um, and he said, if we're not going to postpone or cancel a game, given what happened in Baltimore, like, can you give me a scenario where you think that we would actually have a game that's uh, forfeited or canceled? Well, forfeit's tough to do. You know, there's never been a forfeit in the 101-year history of the National Football League. And it also creates a financial can of worms because when they – crafted the agreements that allowed the 2020 season to proceed, Dan, nothing was contained in there about what would happen with player game checks in the event of a forfeit. I think the NFL is avoiding that possibility for that reason and other reasons. They don't want to go down the path of declaring a winner and a loser because we're in a pandemic. Stuff is going to happen. When do you start drawing the lines between forfeit and postponement? And, you know, this possibility of week 18 – You've been talking about it. I've been talking about it. We've talked about it, I'm sure, when I've been on with you in the past. Yesterday, it finally crystallized for me what the problem is with Week 18. If you may, made Raven Steelers the first game that gets kicked to Week 18, what do you do if the Ravens or the Steelers have an issue the rest of the way with any of their games? What if the Bills have an outbreak next week and the Sunday night game between Pittsburgh and Buffalo has to get postponed? Which one do you play? Yeah. Which one do you not play? 
oh, oh, well, Ravens Steelers was first. That's the one that gets played. Well, what if Bills Steelers has more impact on more teams to determine who gets to the playoffs and who doesn't? And, and so I think the reason they haven't pulled the ripcord on week 18 is they understand that once you burn that spot for two teams, you are operating on a tightrope on a windy day with no net. Uh, the 49ers are without a home. So now they're playing in Arizona. Like, okay. I could, there's so much of this where we go, yeah, okay, that's fine. Niners don't get to play two games at home. They're playing in Arizona. Is that fair? It's not like they're losing a home field advantage. Now, <laughs> I mean, really, it, yeah. they don't have any fans at any of the games at Levi Stadium. When the schedule came out in May, Dan, one of the first things I did was I looked at the schedules of the California teams and I looked at other teams reasonably close by to see if one of these teams couldn't play at home where would there be conflicts? Where would they be home games going on at the same time? And the first thing that jumped out at me, San Francisco, Arizona, they never play a game at home on the same day. I think they've always known that Arizona was the alternative for San Francisco if they couldn't play games there. And it finally happened. I'm fascinated by the idea, and I think it's moving in this direction. They're going to practice in Arizona. They now have a bubble. The 49ers have a bubble. They're going to have everybody in a hotel in Arizona, away from their families for five weeks. I'm still trying to find out what kind of negotiations happened with the union, because you're talking about a dramatic change in work conditions for these players. These players are now 24 seven employees. They can't be with their families. They can't go home. They're on a business trip indefinitely. What did they do by way of talking to the union to get this approved? Because Dan, I think collective bargaining is one of the big reasons why we don't have 32 teams in a bubble, because you're talking about a major ask for a player to say, tell your family goodbye. You'll see them in early January. You can't go home. You can't see them. Uh, that's not what these guys signed up for. Can you imagine if the Super Bowl was in California this year? No, it wouldn't be. Yeah, it would be in Arizona. <laughs> You're also hosting uh, NBC Sports Uncovered, a podcast, and uh, the uh, latest interview is with John Gruden. What did we unearth from the podcast with the new and improved 2.0 John Gruden? <laughs> uh, for me, the most interesting thing was how emotional he can still get about thinking about um, when he was traded to Tampa, the, the, when he was – when the the Raiders were able to say, yeah, we don't we don't really need you anymore. We're going to trade you. It really, I was surprised at how much that still stings for him. Even though he went to Tampa and beat the Raiders in the Super Bowl and really had the ultimate revenge, um, but it still it still is hard for him to talk about. And that that was interesting to me because as hard as I tried to get more information from him, he would say. Uh, it's too painful, and it makes me emotional, and so I'm done talking about that. But given what happened in that Super Bowl, it, it felt like they knew every play that Rich Gannon was calling. Did, does Gruden admit that now that they knew exactly what was going on? He, he, he in a way, yeah. I mean, they, they, they acknowledge the fact that that was one of those years where you didn't have that, that weak break between the end of the season and the Super Bowl or between the end of the playoffs and the Super Bowl that we have now, that sort of bye week. And that really didn't allow uh, the Raiders to change much. And so, yeah, that mm. with that short week of notice uh, or short week of practice and preparation, they weren't able to change much. And, yeah, Gruden, Gruden knew a lot. Was there a moment where you went, oh, my God, you're on the sidelines and you hear a coach go off? Have you had one of those moments? With Gruden? Well, um, anybody, just where the language was a little more colorful than uh, you would have thought. Sure, I have. It, it, uh, you know what's odd about my, my strongest memory of Gruden uh, was early in my, my sidelining career. I was still at CBS, and it was the day after Christmas, and we were doing a game at Oakland. I don't even remember who the other team was because – on Christmas night, the night before the game, I had a surprise in that my, my then boyfriend, now husband, popped the question on Christmas night. So uh, I went out the next day to that game just, you know, like on a cloud, um, and Lance Barrow was the, the producer of the game who kept saying, Michelle, hold the microphone in your left hand so everyone can see the <laughs> ring. And, um, <laughs> and so then I just remember at halftime, I was waiting for Gruden to come out, and Gruden sort of pointed to the ground like, you come over here, I'm not coming to you. 
And so I went over and talked to him. But, you know, I have a great relationship with Gruden because we worked on Monday Night Football on ESPN for a couple of years together. And uh, But, yeah, I mean, the, every coach is – different and they're all they've all got their thing and some guys are really much more polite than you would expect and some guys are really salty who's really polite um you know it's funny dan it doesn't come to mind right away <laughs> <laughs> how does belichick is he ever like expressive with you effusive where he just i i wouldn't say effusive i'm not sure that he's ever really effusive unless he's talking about a great story uh, or something historical in football. Um, but, you know, he, he look, I'm appreciative of any coach that's willing under those circumstances to talk to you. Uh, I do have a, a, a memory of him going into that last Super Bowl we covered in Arizona, and I remember they were heading into the locker room for the last time before kickoff, and I caught up with him and I said, let me just ask you, do you get nervous before these big games? And he goes, yeah, I do. <laughs> And I thought that was interesting because he's a guy that would never really let on that things, you know, bother him and that or that, that he's anything but just feet on the ground and everything. So I, I thought that was really interesting. Um, you know, it's it's a game to game thing, Dan, and you just kind of go into each interview with these coaches, whether they're winning or losing, just bracing for the worst and trying not to ask a stupid question. So, Pat, I just wonder, when we say, well, it's based on the eye test, it's based off your resume, if Ohio State only plays four or five games, I don't know how that playoff selection committee can honestly look at them and go, yep, they're one of the four best teams in the country. As much as we want to base this on, you know, past, uh, uh, the talent they have, who's the quarterback, they 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 haven't done anything to distinguish themselves as one of the four best teams in the country when it's all said and done. Right? No, I mean, that's the thing. You'd be looking at basically a half a resume compared to some other schools that have played literally twice as many games. You know, Brian Kelly, it was pretty interesting, a couple of games ago, made a point when they got to eight, he said, we have played a Big Ten schedule. <laughs> uh, he made his point pretty clear that, you know, that the, the different number of games will be a major – flashpoint arguing point for the committee and for fans everywhere. And Gary Barta, the chair of the selection committee, did say last night that it's close for four between Ohio State and Texas A&M, which has lost but has played more games. So I think the committee is absolutely going to look at that. And I th that's going to be a down-to-the-wire discussion. I mean, if you're Ohio State, you really need to play every possible game. Could you see a scenario where Florida beats Alabama and Clemson barely beats Notre Dame and they would still all stay in the top four, and they would cancel out Ohio State. Yeah. Oh, I think that I think if Florida beats Alabama, that that you would have a pretty strong argument for two SEC teams, and then absolutely a fifth Clemson. Like Notre Dame, I think is really close to being in right now. You know, all they've got to do is even play with a loss. Even with a loss, as long as they don't get dump trucked. You know, if they, if it's if it's a four touchdown loss, and Trevor Lawrence lights them up, and you can say, oh, that's the difference. Uh, then that may it may preclude them. But if it's if it's a close game and they have beaten Clemson once and lost to them once, I, I think they're they're pretty close to being in. And I think Alabama, same thing. As long as if they could lose to Florida, as long as they didn't fifty six to nothing, which it wouldn't be, uh, and I, I think probably still get in as well. When was the last time you covered a Steeler team that had this? Well, least dramatic Steeler team in how many years? <laughs> well, you know. Uh, it's funny because every year it seems to come up. I don't think there's any question, Dan, that two years ago with the Le'Veon Bell situation and the Antonio Brown situation, uh, I don't think that drama could ever be surpassed no matter what happens. And, <laughs> and I think because the Steelers are such a marquee team, and as you know, being in the business, they are a team that moves the needle. And because of that, they receive a lot of attention. It's also because they tend to have a lot of the game's top stars. So – and go back to Antonio Brown and Le'Veon Bell. So when those situations arise, they get magnified and people pay attention because it is the Steelers. And, and so there always seems to be this, this um, cloud of drama surrounding them. But let's face it, when you look at their performance and their record, you know, Mike Tomlin's never had a losing season in, in 14 years. Um, it's pretty amazing. I mean, it's testament to him and to the organization that they kind of ferret their way through that and, and still still manage to be successful. Are they a balanced team or are they a defensive-minded team? 
Well, you know, the funny thing right now, Dan, aside from the fact that they don't run the ball very well, you know, their offense is as good as it's been. I mean, they're the only team in the AFC to score 24 or more points in every game. Even Kansas City can't say that. Um, Ben Roethlisberger is having uh, arguably his best season, certainly statistically. Um, And and the, the, the run defense has actually suffered the last three, four weeks. I think they're a very well balanced team. They're a team that can score points. And to me, to me, Dan, they are the one team in the league that is equipped to stop any of these other offenses, including Kansas City's. Now, I'm not saying they will, but they are equipped to do it because you know they have all pros at all three levels. They can they sack the quarterback. They have a pretty they have a, a, a larcenous secondary. They take the ball away. And yeah, they're missing Devin Bush. I thought that was a big, big loss yeah. because I thought he was the one player they could least afford to lose because they don't have anybody else like him. But when you look at Cam Hayward and Stephon Tewitt up front, and you got those two edge guys, Watt and Dupree, um, and, and then a, a really solid secondary with Minka Fitzpatrick, um, you know they're 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 equipped to play however you want and to and, and to you know bottle up a team as 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 well as anybody in the league can do it. We saw this with the NBA in the bubble, the NHL in the uh, bubble. We saw this with Major League Baseball. Does the NFL have blinders on? that it's just whatever it takes, we're playing these games, even if it's not a true representation of the teams that uh, we expect to be on the field? Yeah, I think a little bit. I, I think that the reality is this. I actually got into to a friend of mine who's an attorney last night about this because she asked me, do you think the season's going to be viewed the same or watered down? I said, no, I think, I think because there's a lot of challenges tied to it that it'll still be weighed equally, if not greater, because of those challenges. I said, I do think that this week needs to be a huge learning example for the NFL because, you know, the Ravens have to play their game because of their COVID outbreak. They got a thousand starters out, but a lot of like, you know, their quarterbacks out, which is obviously a huge deal. And it may not be that big a deal because it's the regular season and there's 16 games and it's not a lose and go home sudden death environment. But what would happen if it was the first or second round of the playoffs and it's Patrick Mahomes or it's Aaron Rodgers? And those guys can't play in that game because of contact tracing or something. That's a huge problem for the NFL. And it is sudden death, win or go home type of thing. And so um, I get it that they want to get to the playoffs, but they need to learn from this past week because that that would be unacceptable. If I said you can have the Chiefs or the field to win the Super Bowl. Chiefs in a runaway. No one's beating them. Here – Here's, I wrote this down this morning. This is how the Chiefs are going to not win the Super Bowl this year. I want to find my notes. Okay. Yeah. The Chiefs, to not win the Super Bowl, um, that you, you have to hope that they play their C game, which they haven't really this year. You have to hold the ball as long as you possibly can. I don't care how you hold it. You have to hold it. If it's your run game, great. If it's your perimeter screen game, it's the quick game and the pass game, that's fine. You have to force threes and not sevens on defense. At least three times, you've got to make them kick a field goal and not a touchdown. You have to make them drive the field. You've got to stop the explosive pass game. You know, so many coordinators go, we got to stop the run game. No, you have to stop the explosive pass game. Make Mahomes play boring football. Um, You've got to be able to have a quarterback that can create special plays as much as Mahomes does. He's got to match the... I went above the X's and O's plays as much as Mahomes does. So, um, and then in the fourth quarter, you got to make more big plays. People think it's the Tennessee Titans that can beat the Chiefs. If if you told me they had Taylor Lewan, I'd be a little bit more on board with that. Uh, I think the team that can do it is the Buffalo Bills. Um, I think the Bills can go punch for punch with them offensively. I think their quarterback can make some like weird plays that go above X's and O's and they can be explosive offensively. But Kansas City was lucky to win the Super Bowl last year, Dan. I go back to the knee injury with Patrick mm-hmm. Mahomes. Then you get to the playoffs where they could have easily lost all of those games. But nothing is diff- – like, I, that, that's fair. But if they go down 14, I still 100% unequivocally believe in them. Like, I just their, – their quarterback does so much stuff with his physical talent and then his brain, like it's, he sees things so fast. Cause if they go down 14, they're still going to have 50 plus snaps. That's why like the holding the football is such a big deal. And yes, they probably could have, 
and arguably should have lost the Super Bowl, but that was a ridiculously good defense in, in San Francisco. Another team that I would give you that I would – I think the Colts have a chance because they're cut the same way as, as mm. San Francisco was last year. Um, I just – I look at that offense and I go, there's no flaw. Kelsey's the best player in football that's not a quarterback. Um, and Wait, wait. I, you think Kelsey is – He's the best player who's not a quarterback. Yeah. Wow. Over Aaron Donald? Man, he does. What? Over Aaron Donald? I mean, for me, yes, because okay. the stuff, be, okay. just because he brings so much offense to their offense before the ball ever gets snapped. I mean, the, the amount of times they place him in, in specific positions to get the coverage is is like is such an a, a advantage because it doesn't just affect the outcome of the play after the snap like he will go out there and they'll put a corner out there and the Mahomes knows it's going to be zone and then he'll go to two high safeties here comes run game and for me like th that six yard run is huge because now you, there's nothing you as a defense can do like I, I can literally go to the line of scrimmage and get into whatever play I want as great as Aaron is he's remarkable but he doesn't create defense before the snap as much as Kelsey creates offense. But could snap. you do you think we're going to look at Kelsey as being the greatest tight end of all time when it's all said and done? Um, I mean, I there's if they go on the dynasty run like I expect them to over the next five years, absolutely. I mean, he's on a historic season run this year. Like is Gronk um, the greatest tight end of all time? Yes, Gronk's the greatest tight end of all time. And Gronk is the first guy that did this stuff. Yeah. Like, Gronk is the first guy that did all this for Brady. And, um, you know, I know he was probably more impactful in the run game. I'm not a person who looks at that stuff. At the end of the day, does my offense score a lot of points and does this guy help us do it? You know, and so that's why I think Kelsey's got a chance to do that. We love to give a grade after a trade. Like, who got the better end of the deal with uh, the Rockets and the Wizards? I don't want John Wall at any price. Uh, Russell Westbrook feels like you could have him play with Bradley Beal. And uh, I'm interested to see James Harden and uh, John Wall play together. Tim McMahon does this for a living. He's the ESPN NBA reporter. Let me start with uh, give it a, a winner and a loser here, Tim. Who got the better end of this deal? I mean, let's be realistic. This is a mutual sell-low trade of max salaries. John Wall hasn't played in two years. The report's coming out of... Uh, you know, his workouts, the pickup games he's played is that he looks good, but two years off coming back from a torn Achilles, the three years left of a max salary is not exactly a desirable formula. The Rockets were able to get the protected first round pick. They felt like they needed that asset if they were going to trade Russell Westbrook. But it's hard to say that, uh, that the Rockets are winners when they just traded the guy who, for all his flaws, was a third team all NBA selection. And, you know, uh, last off season, they gave up Chris Paul, two first round picks and two pick swaps. So, you know, that's not, it's, it's the Rockets really making the best out of a situation that went bad. Why couldn't they keep Russell Westbrook? It just got to the point where Russell Westbrook did not want to be in Houston. You know, as for as long as he had a friendship with James Harden, as much as they mutually pushed to play together, Russell Westbrook, was not happy in Houston. You know, he made it clear to the Rockets that he wanted to, quote, play my game. Uh, <laughs> he, you know, and, and we'll see how that works in Washington with Bradley Beal. But, you know, everybody remembers uh, his, his rough performance in the bubble. He's coming off of coronavirus. You know, he obviously strained his quad. He was a shell of himself in the bubble. People forget that for the two and a half months before the season was halted, this guy was averaging 32-8-8 eight and, eight and playing the most efficient basketball uh, of his career. And I say people, apparently <laughs> Russell Westbrook is one of the people that forgot that because he did not want to stay in Houston. Yeah. I misspoke last hour. I said that he had performed well in the bubble. He didn't perform in, and he had COVID, but prior to the bubble, he performed extremely well, but also it feels like Russ with Bradley Beal makes a whole lot more sense than Russ with James Harden. Yeah. Uh, obviously Bradley Beal is, you know, much more capable and, and, and much better suited to to play off the ball. It is – and look, it's still, Russ needs to go to Washington understanding that it is Bradley Beal's team and that the biggest priority for the Wizards 
is ensuring that Bradley Beal wants to stay in Washington for a long, long time. But I think it is more of a 1A, 1B situation than it, than it was in, in Houston where, it, look, James Harden is not an off-ball player. At some point, he's, especially if he gets his wish and ends up moving to another destination, you know, playing in Brooklyn, if, if that's the case, he's going to have to adapt and play off the ball more. But he is arguably the best isolation player in the world, and that's what the Rockets' offense uh, has revolved around, certainly in recent years. And as long as Harden's there, it's going to be difficult to, uh, to make drastic changes there. Unless I get another team involved in this, Tim, and I don't know if that team, like is Golden State really in this, or is there another team aside from Brooklyn interested in James Harden? Look, the team that you're going to hear the most about is the Philadelphia 76ers. Uh, obviously, Daryl Morey is a huge fan of James Harden. You can argue that the Daryl or that the James Harden trade really kind of made Daryl Morey's career. And Daryl will be the first one uh, to say that. But uh, the, the, 70, the, the Rockets have been very clear. They are not going to move James Harden at 70 cents on the dollar. They do not feel any urgency to move James Harden. Rather, they would try to repair that. They want to try to repair that relationship. Time is on their side. He has two guaranteed years left on that deal. What the Rockets insist they would have to have in any potential trade for Harden would be a young franchise cornerstone in a massive haul of draft picks, a Drew Holiday-type haul. Well, that's what I uh, wondered, though, Tim. What Milwaukee gave up to get Drew Holiday. If I'm the Rockets, I'm going, we're going to give you maybe the best scorer in NBA history and mm -hmm. still has years on, on you know his legs. I, I don't know what you can give up. Like, if I'm the 76ers and if I said to you, I'm going to give you Joel Embiid and maybe an expiring contract or something. Like, what would it take for the 76ers to actually get James Harden where the Rockets would feel like, hey, we did okay in this deal? Yeah, I mean, obviously the conversation would have to start with either Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons, and then we're talking about picks upon picks upon picks. <laughs> and really, uh, look, the Drew Holiday trade, that's three picks and, and two uh, you know, pick swap rights. I think that, that if you're the Rockets, you have to kind of dig your heels in and all this stuff can, can change, but for now, the Rockets can afford to be patient. And again, they can afford to, to prioritize trying to kind of get Harden back on board. Uh, he apparently is excited about, or not, I don't know, excited, on board with the idea of playing with John Wall. Oh, God. Um, well, listen, here's the deal. If the Rockets don't win, that pressure really picks up for them to trade Harden. And, and I think the, the leverage is on the Rockets' side until the trade deadline passes. And then it's, he's, he's going in the last year of his contract and the leverage really shifts. But they've got time on their side at this moment and, and for the next few months. Let's look at the supporting cast for the Lakers prior to the start of this last season and the supporting cast prior to the start of this season. How would you compare yeah, the I, two? I, I think that uh, Dennis Schroeder is an, is an upgrade in the sense that they now have a guy who is a, can, can get his own offense, can, can create his own offense, you know, can uh, really do some major damage off the dribble. I think that the pick and roll with him and Montrez Harrell has a lot of potential. You know, you, you, you looked at what Montrez Harrell was able to do with Lou Williams uh, with the Clippers. I think there's going to be a lot of carry over there uh, with Dennis Schroeder. You know, moving Danny Green and being able to replace him with Wes Matthews uh, at, at a much lower salary, I thought was a significant win for the Lakers. But, you know, look, I'll say this. When you have LeBron James and Anthony Davis playing in L.A. for the most glamorous franchise in the league, um, I give credit to Rob Palenka for the moves that he's been able to make, but there's a pretty significant advantage uh, in terms of being able to recruit with exceptions and being able to recruit with minimum salaries when you have two stars with that franchise. It feels like if there's a way to turn a story, twist a story, and make it negative about LeBron, we do that. And I think we do that with LeBron more than any other athlete, yeah. modern-day athlete. I think he's a bargain at, yeah, at, at that price. But well, you know. I'm just waiting for the, the negative spin of LeBron was greedy, makes all this money off the floor. Why not take less money? And then you ensure you win more titles, you win more titles. Now you can be on par or above Michael Jordan. Okay. The Lakers are the defending champion. 
They're the favorites going in. Uh, they have an established perennial all NBA co-star form in Anthony Davis, who's locked up long term. I just talked about all the recruiting advantages uh, that the Lakers have. Rob Plink has proven that he's able to not only put together a championship caliber supporting cast, but be flexible in upgrading that on a year to year basis. LeBron James, without question, and there's no argument against it, has everything in place to be able to win a championship with but the Lakers. Why he's is this did. why is he polarizing, Tim? You know, I think that I mean is to go back been, to the decision, the fact that he he left to win championships. Like what is it? I don't I don't understand it. Uh, look, LeBron is polarizing because he's an historically great player who's been in the spotlight, uh, in the international spotlight, since he's been 16 or 17 years old. But who else is like that? Jordan wasn't polarizing. Patrick Jordan, Mahomes Jordan. isn't. Uh, and I think the NFL and NBA are a little bit different. Okay. Beasts. Jordan obviously played in a, in a completely different era. But Would he LeBron's be polarizing now? If Jordan played now? Would he be polarizing? I'm I'm absolutely sure that he would be. Now, uh, how much can you really criticize a guy who's winning championships every single year? Look, would we have found something to criticize? Would we have found things to nitpick? Absolutely. And and for LeBron, I think part of the reason he's polarizing is there's the whole LeBron versus Jordan argument. Obviously, you know the fact that he is a historically great star who is you know, taking advantage of his leverage and, and move teams repeatedly, that plays into it for a while. And I think the championship in L.A. Uh, eased this, but it was LeBron versus Kobe, even among uh, Lakers fans. So <laughs> it's always going to be something. And look, part of the reason he's polarizing is because <laughs> we need to have conversations like this to, to oh fill air. Let's be honest about it. Yeah. And, and, and Twitter and everything else. I wondered, I mean, Jordan with social media – I just think uh, I want. I'm curious how he would have handled that. Yeah, and you know, I, and plus there, he wasn't on of- the cover of Sports Illustrated at 16. LeBron was the chosen one, like Bryce right. Harper. We're waiting for Bryce Harper to be great, and he'll never live up to what he's probably supposed to be. LeBron has lived up to what the hype was, and the hype was at immeasurable. Right, and, and that's what's crazy about LeBron. He has lived up to impossibly high standards. The hype was this guy is going to be one of the all-time great players in NBA history, and he's exceeded those expectations. And really the biggest PR misstep in his life is that people didn't like the way that he decided to take advantage of his rights as a free agent to leave Cleveland for Miami. The decision, if that's the biggest PR misstep of a guy who's been in hot, international spotlight for 20 years that ain't bad especially when you know he more than made up to it uh to to cavaliers fans and the the people of cleveland the people of ohio by going back and essentially gifting that city its first uh its first major championship in over a half a century all right set me set set this straight now i know you never want to be listed as a seven footer i think the the quote was because seven footers are considered freaks Bill, you're not 6'11". I would love to be seven feet tall. I love just being taller and taller and getting so much tall higher up on the mountain there. But the last time I was measured, I was 19 years old, and I was at UCLA, and John Wooden was always in charge of, of the measuring, right? And, uh, and he would stand on the ladder with the ruler that you put on top of your head as you stood next to the wall, right? And, and Ducky Drake, the trainer, uh, legendary Ducky Drake was incredibly instrumental in Rayford Johnson's remarkable life and career and light a candle and say a prayer for Rafer, who just passed on yesterday. But it was, a you know, he, John Wooden would call up everybody in alphabetical order. So we had Henry Bibby and we had Greg Lee and we had Larry Hollyfield and Larry Farmer and Sven Mater and all, all, all the guys. And, and then he, and as he, as they walk up and you know, Coach Wooden puts the ruler on top of their head and he calls out, okay, Greg Lee, 6'5". Uh, Henry Bibby, 6'2". Uh, uh, Larry Hollyfield, 6'5". Larry Farmer, 6'6". Six, six. And then Swen Nader, 7 feet tall. And he says, Walton, your turn, alphabetical. I get up off my stool and I walk toward him and I get halfway across the room and he says, you're 6'11". Go see <laughs> but that was the last time I was like... You got to be 7'2". 
No, I'm not. I feel like I'm about eight or nine feet tall, <laughs> especially after the the camping world of the Maui gym in Asheville that we just had this week. That was just over the top. But whenever I stand next to Kareem, then I know I'm I'm barely six eleven. And then whenever I stand next to Yao Ming, <laughs> well, Yao Ming, him or Mark Eaton are the two biggest players. But that's not even close between Yao Ming and Mark Eaton. You know, Mark Eaton is seven four, and and, and Yao Ming is uh, is seven thirteen. <laughs> <laughs> Yao and Yao's so big too. It's not how big you are; it's how big you play. Why is the national media fascinated with Carson Wentz? Good guy, um, not a self promoter. Uh, I, I was I was thinking about this the other day, Dan. If any other quarterback, or most, should I say, they'd be he. Well, he wouldn't be playing most of the time. Now, the fact that they have a backup who's a rookie, who I who we know is a winner, but you paid him a lot, um, and Carson doesn't really bother anybody. Dan, what's not to like? He came in as the underdog. Remember, even though he's a high draft pick, comes out of North Dakota State, so. He's kind of like, oh, small school guy. So you kind of root for that. But why you did know, they you're draft Jalen Hurts? Why did well, they draft because, him? Well, why would the, you know, you got the Redskins or the Washington football team now. You take Robert Griffin and DeShannon, you know, Mike liked uh, Kirk Cousins as well. Ain't nothing wrong with that. We, we draft two linemen. Why the hell can't we draft two quarterbacks? So to me, it's. But a second it's round pick, though, that you but, use, right? Dan, I'll tell you why because that ought to tell you how they feel about him. They didn't draft him to move him to slot or wide receiver or running back. Jalen Hurts is a quarterback, and I think he proved by going to Lincoln Riley that, oh, we know he's a winner. It's Alabama under the Saban umbrella. Well, he goes to Lincoln Riley, and boom, he proves that he can still win and still throw it. I actually love the draft pick because it's either going to bring out the best in Carson Wentz or, unfortunately, whether it's Jalen Hurts or not, bringing out the worst. I did think Carson's a good guy people root for, but he's playing missing easy throws. The mechanics are horrendous, and it seems to me like he's always a split second late. And when you're pulling, when you're not pulling the trigger on open throws, then that's a problem. I will not be shocked if this continues. That if Jalen Hurts doesn't get le- legitimate run, and I root for Carson Wentz like everybody else does, but he's not above criticism. He is not playing good football. All right, how often do you go to the bathroom over a seven-hour period? Zero times. I've taken one bathroom break in the last probably eight plus years this is season 12 of nfl red zone and i took one bathroom break and i was playing hurt that day so i had i had an excuse but nope i I do not go to the bathroom for all seven hours when you're doing your job you know because we would get criticized on sports center because of the highlights we would pick they thought keith oberman and i picked the highlights and then they'd get upset or, hey, you never show us in a positive light. You don't show longer highlights with us like you do the Yankees or the Red Sox. What kind of criticism do you get on the red zone with highlights, the you know, frequency, and the length? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because I thought we were the only ones. There's look, seven hours, commercial-free football, every touchdown from every game. There's a lot to like, right? And, and everyone loves it by and large. But if there's a negative to it, it's we have done our jobs so well, I think, that we have spawned a generation of wannabe television executives. Because everybody (laughs) thinks they know where we're supposed to be at the moment that we're supposed to be there. And everyone thinks their team is getting slighted. And everyone thinks that, you know, I hate this team or I hate that team or whatever. And I'm like, guys, no one no one in the country wants to show you more football than the guy you're listening to right now. Trust me on that. And the thing is, they're watching NFL Red Zone. I'm watching eight, nine games at the same time. So they've got to trust us to make the decision. I'm so glad that you said you guys got that grief on SportsCenter because it's the one negative that I hear, and I'm like, you're not going to miss anything. Trust us. You're not going to miss it. Let me shift it to uh, basketball. And – I know that we, there's always people in the media are going to spin it and look at the negative side of LeBron James. And I heard this. I think Skip Airline. Bayless even brought it up. It. Hey, you know what? He should have taken less money. You want to win championships. You want to be oh, like that Jordan. That makes me so mad. But, it makes me so mad. Okay. So should LeBron have taken? I, I said LeBron did take less. I mean, he's making less money than like six other guys 
John Wall makes more than LeBron James. So should he have taken less? Here's the problem, Dan. Let's say he did that. And I'm not naming names. You, you, you named Skip. I didn't see Skip say that. I'll take your word for it. Skip's a colleague, and I obviously have immense respect for him. But I, what I will say is this. If LeBron James had said, guys, I'm going to sign for the minimum, guess what? The exact same people criticizing him for taking the max would say he's trying to stack the deck by taking the minimum. <laughs> this is, and you know that to be true. Yeah. If LeBron said, I'll take the minimum, and the Lakers went out and signed Giannis, then it, wa- it would be, okay, LeBron is running from competition. Just like last year, it was, it was you know, oh, LeBron wants it too easy by, by adding Kawhi. Now he is supposed to make it too easy Listen, LeBron James is the most underpaid athlete in American sports. I don't think that's really debatable. I know it's an odd thing to say, but it's true. And here's the problem for the the contingent of people that dislike LeBron. They only have the six rings thing left. And in their heart of hearts, they know we've only got two, maybe three years left to hit that one. Because the Lakers are going to win again. And then they're at five. And then if you think he's not going to peel at least one more like Kareem did late, late in his career as a role player, you're nuts. So when LeBron finishes with the most points of all time, the third most assists of all time, 13 finals appearances, six rings, what's going to happen is folks are going to say, wait, this was a debate? And so, like, it's nice that LeBron has not taken over. Like, there was the story that came out. He tried to sign Luka to Team LeBron, but Nike kept Luka with Jordan. I think that was actually a really nice thing for Nike to do. That way in 30 years, people know what Michael, they're like, oh, he didn't just have the shoes. He also played basketball. But because it's going to be, everything else is going to be LeBron. All of it. Maybe even that statue outside the United States. All of them. (laughs) Well, maybe you have LeBron guarding Jordan outside the United Center. Oh, I like that. Do you think LeBron gets a statue at Staples if they win one more? No. There was All right, so there's this speculation that LeBron matched up his contract length with when his kid, when Bronny graduates high school, right? Yeah. And I think it's totally unfair, but we all discuss it anyway because LeBron has alluded to this. I think maybe Bronny can make the NBA one day, but talking about him as a high school to pro guy, if they change the rules, it's super high expectations. But let's say they change the rules, and let's say he is the 50th best prospect on your board. If it is clear... If you draft him, LeBron signs with you. Does he become worth the number one overall pick? Three years from now, (laughs) it's a package deal. You have the number one pick. You would be taking the 50th best prospect, a fringe NBA 19-year-old. But LeBron comes with it. No. 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 Fifth pick? Not in three years. Oh. Oh, in three years, because LeBron will, at that point, only be, like, the third best player in the league. I, <laughs> I don't know I if Bronny can play. Like, I don't I don't know if he's able to play in the I NBA. have no idea. Yeah. I, I mean, he, he can definitely play. Yeah. But I, is, he, uh, is he going to be a guy that can make the league, much less make the league at, right out of high school? Now we're talking about totally unfair expectations. Yeah, because but I got three more uh, seasons of playoff basketball for LeBron. Uh, nobody's had this wear and tear, you know, Kareem, you know, you had guys who played a long period of time, but nobody's had the wear and tear that LeBron has had on his body. And in three years, I don't know what he's going to be like. Uh, even if I get his son, I, you know, I, I don't want somebody, Hey, come out and watch LeBron play, you know, 18 minutes. I don't want to see that. No, and I don't know if LeBron will ever play. I he, listen, I think he's going to be able to play, until he's 40. But would, would you rather have LeBron with his son or LeBron against his son? What's a better so story? That, uh, oh, I think LeBron against his son is better. I also would think it would maybe be better for his son. 